told that if I want to uh, embrace my inner Seattle and fit in a little bit more here in the city that I need to up my flannel game. And so I'm here at one of the Seattle Goodwill stores to see what I can find. Seattle, home of tattoos and top knots. Hey look, they don't have that in Dallas. A physical Amazon bookstore with a selection curated damn near perfectly? I can dig that. Attempting to make Seattle a place I not just explore, but call home. I've been struck by all the ways that my time at the Finca in Honduras continues to filter how I view everyday life. So I decided to grab a beer with my two amazing housemates, Nils and Francesca, also two former Finca volunteers, and talk about the imprint that that little slice of the third world continues to have on us. So a quick recap. I lived for two years with other volunteers at a children's home in northern Honduras, one of the most impoverished countries in the world. These were kids who often had families but couldn't live with them due to extreme poverty or abuse or often both. Sharing a few years with them was remarkable and devastating. It was the most heartbreaking and refreshing time of my life. Okay, I think first I'm interested in hearing how time at the Finca impacted how you view and how you relate to family. One of the things that was very striking for me when I was down there was having left for two years my own family and being around kids who are also away from their own families and thrown into this situation where you're, you know, for lack of a better term, familyless. Did that impact how you relate to and think about family now that you're back? Family. Uh, I have a lot of thoughts on family, especially from the farm. I met my now wife at the big day. It's a very concrete shifting of family. Coming from a certain new family, we didn't get married at the big uh, We started dating like the day we had just left the big <laughs> to eventually become a legally family. Sharing in life with the kiddos at the farm who I was without my family by choice for those 27 months. They are without their family, very much not by choice. Um, and seeing the hurt that they carry with them, some of them just every day because, because of what they experienced in their family, because of not being with their family, because they were often told that they had this family at the farm that maybe they didn't feel didn't represent family to them. That uh, pretty radically changed the way that I experienced my own or my own idea of what of what family has been in my life. Okay. Um, simply put, you can say I appreciated my family more, um, but I feel like that smells a bit of like pity, and I didn't like pity the part of them all for like their situation, but I think. Uh, there is a deeper appreciation for the fact that I grew up with my family. Yeah. Okay, let's talk for a second about a 
a pillar of the farm. <laughs> Talk about simplicity. Um, like on a, a practical level, has did the experiences of the farm, whether they were uh, something that we chose to, to live as a, a house or as something that was part and parcel of living in Honduras, like the water going out constantly or the electricity going out, has that impacted how you live here in Seattle? In the culture that I come from, the status quo is you go to college, you go to grad school, you get a high paying job, you get married, you have a house, you have kids, X, Y, Z, you kind of are like moving up the ladder constantly. Um, and I think the freedom and simplicity that comes from me is freedom from feeling tied to that ladder. And I know this could be a stereotype of a lot of people's third world experiences, especially if they're like short term missions or that kind of experiences. Oftentimes I hear people come back and say uh, from a short term mission, oh my goodness, like they're so generous, like they they had this like two liter of coke and they gave us all of it. It's like they have so little but they gave so much, like that's a really stereotypical view of it. But there's a real there's a whole lot of truth to a lot of that too, but I don't think it's necessarily like, oh, they just like want to give everything and then um, it's almost like a different mindset of finding joy in giving rather than wanting to take everything. Um, and I notice that a lot, not only with kids at the Finca wanting to like give us their toys. Um, maybe it like helps us remember them, but they also just want to share. It's like, hey, this is what I have to give and I'm going to give it. And I saw that a lot with our neighbors, um, and house dads and house moms, um, just really having embodying the sort of simplicity that is rather than gathering stuff, it's it's sort of like this mindset of simplicity is give. That idea of such a generous outpouring of giving and sharing especially, I'm just giving sharing, um, was so striking from everything that, that I had experienced both in um, uh, my own family life, my own community growing up, like never before had I um, had that in, been surrounded by this instinct of like if you need or even just want something of mine, like it's yours. Like just 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 use it. Um, two ways that I think I think I helped breathe life into my spirit is uh, small things, so little little secrets you find find in nature. You know, like just taking time to appreciate the amigas or the ants, uh, certain plants or birds or the waves. Yeah, just closing my eyes at night and hearing. Um, just really beautiful, being in touch with some of the beauty there. Real keen sense of beauty. Um, and one other way be the way that kids can just smother you with love in a lot of ways. I know that in many situations that didn't happen in the Finca, but there are some really special times that uh, I think there is there is a sort of like rubbing off of God's love in some of the moments. And it's just an embrace. A lot of the more painful moments at, at the Finca had a, a big effect on my, my spirituality. And um, I think specifically on, on the, the idea of petitional prayer, like after one of our kids was, uh, it, like had to leave because of uh, uh, some of the things that that child had done, it, um, and just knowing like that they, they would not be going to a better place. But they, the decision was made that they couldn't stay, and all of like the whole community that like knew this situation was was going on were just rallying around, especially in prayer, because it, it, it felt so out of our hands. The decision was not ours ours to make. And the only thing that we could do was was pray for a change with this child, um, that the behavior would change so that the child could stay in what would so obviously be a better, healthier place, even though it was so far from perfect. Um, 
and and that that not happening um, just like I think it it broke that peace inside of me. If something with such a good child, if that prayer can't be answered, like I have no desire to ask for anything else, and I'm not going to anymore. Like if, if anybody else is saying like, hey, will you join me in prayer for the church fundraiser or something like that that's that's going on, it's like, sure, I'll join in. Like it's not like a, a protest or anything like that. It's just, am I, but I've, I've lost any sort of uh, desire or motivation to, to, to start or do anything like that personally. Um, because it seemed like when it was on the line and it mattered most, it went unanswered. Um, and I'm so open to that, that changing. Um, here in the, the future, and hope that it, it will. But but at the moment, you know, like I know that's one thing that that, that changed for me. One of my mentalities going into the farm was this idea that the world needs saving, and I'm the one to save it, and I have to save it. Um, living at the farm, you are quickly broken of that mentality when you realize that there is so much hurt, brokenness, pain whatever word you want to put on it out there that no one can fix it. And our role is to fix. And I think, I think some of my biggest stumbling blocks at the farm were those moments when I was trying to fix, fix, fix instead of being with the kids, with the house parents, with my community members, alone with myself. Um, and I think coming out of the farm one of the greatest lessons that I very uh, painfully learned over the 27 months was how to really be with people, be with them in whatever it is that they're going through. The minute I have this mentality of wanting to like fix and make things right is the minute that I step more into myself and my own uh, ego or desires as well intentioned as it is. And when I'm able to step out of that, I was so often forced out of that at the bar. <laughs> Um, I realized the incredible power in sitting and seeing someone and hearing someone and even if it means I sit with a mom in silence for five minutes and we're watching their two-year-old play on the floor or we're just sitting looking at each other. Um, those are the moments, those are the reasons why that person shows up. Or the kiddo comes to my office for another visit. Um, yeah, it's been a, it's a, it's a continual work of, uh, a work of heart, and so, yeah, I'm That's good. That deserves a high five. That's a good answer. <laughs> A good beer and listening to Francesca and Nils helped me process a lot of the stuff I'd been afraid to think too much about after coming back. How do I relate to the most important people in my life, my family, after living with kids who have none? How come I struggle so much to maintain a generous and living outlook that was so essential to life at the Finca? Is it bad that faith was such a motivating factor in going down there and yet feels like one of the first things I lost? And how come it changed me so much in some ways, and yet left me the same in others? I didn't walk away with answers to those questions, but knowing I have friends who understand my need to ask them was maybe an even greater gift. So, here's to a life full of questions worth asking.